As you know, I am Jamilet Cano and I'm the founder of Louder, but also an ambassador for female entrepreneurs worldwide. It's the largest business platform here in Asia Pacific. And the main point and objective of this platform is to connect aspiring entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, or those who just want to learn more about different topics on these online sessions. Hashtag ask few anything. You ask, we reply. And I can see also, oh, we have someone else from North America. Rachel is also joining us from Canada. It's also late for her. You know, the housekeeping rules, very, very simple. If you want to ask any question to a speaker, then you can chat, type it in the chat box and I can help you ask that question. Or if you are brave enough and you want to talk to Kara directly, please just raise your hand, make a movement or some kind of gesture, and I will allow you to go on the stage and ask the question to her. Well, a lot of you might know her. She has a very, very wonderful TED Talk. And if you haven't watched it, please do so because I was really, really impressed. And I know that that takes a lot of effort, energy, and passion to do so. We have Kara Logan Berlin connecting directly from New York City. And she's gonna tell us how to get resources and support for our business vision. Kara is the CEO and founder of Harvest which is a consulting firm that has led nonprofit organizations to successfully get private funding. And her main objectives are to increase revenue, have organizational sustainability, and also team development. So today she's gonna to give us all her hacks and tips on how to get that support. And more specifically, I'm sure we're gonna talk about how to ask for that money and fundraise, which she is an expert on. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, please welcome Kara here on our online stage. Hi Kara, how are you? I'm well, thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. I've been looking forward to it for weeks. Perfect. We too. We too. I tell you, as I said, I have been watching your TED Talk forever. I want to start with what's like, what do you tell us about your background and especially how do you get that confidence to talk to people and ask them for what you need for your projects and the people that you're working with? You know, it's a great question. My background is you know, very similar to many people that are in the development field, which is they fell into it by accident. Um, I grew up in Eastern Oregon in like a really small town on the West Coast. I went to school in Northern California. I lived abroad in Spain for a year. I went back to California, got my master's, um, ended up moving to New York City uh, for what I thought would be six months, and it'll be 20 years this fall. Um, and started in, I had a background in special events. So I got a job at a nonprofit doing events. Um, and that led to another development job, which led to a bigger job, which led to, and I just sort of followed the thread into being like, I'm good at this thing. I can do this. You know, I went to work at a nonprofit thinking I might want to be on the program side. And they, after they interviewed me, they said, you know, have you ever thought about raising money? And I was like, not really. Um, and I did it and I realized I was really good at it and I was really good at it. And most other people hated it and I didn't hate it. And I thought I can serve this mission doing the thing I'm really good at. So maybe I do that. Um, and then I just learned to love it. So the confidence, I mean, a lot of it is fake it till you make it. I mean, you know, as with, you know, as with anything, if you can get in the room and you can be confident and you can build relationships. Um, I also am very lucky that I always sort of leaned into like, this is who I am and this is how I do this. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. Uh, I, I have always thought that people that are great fundraisers were probably very good daters. Mm -hmm. um, because I was a great dater because if it was not a match, I'm like, yeah, no, this is not going to happen. And if they didn't like me, I was like, yeah, not a match. Like, it's fine. Um, which is a lot of what it is when you're talking to people about investing in your work and you're trying to get them excited. It's not going to be for everybody and it can't be something you take personally. Um, and that's something, you know, I think anyone who's an entrepreneur needs to remember because 
you can sure internalize all that rejection and let it just beat you down. And it's not about you. Like it's the right match or it's not. It's, it's all about, I guess, being honest and transparent with oneself and understanding that some things are good for us and some things might not be the best, but we still have to, and I'm going to connect this to one of your statements in your TED talk where you're saying we have to understand the feelings behind about what we feel about money, but I guess is the feelings behind everything what we do in life. And for that, how do people and professionals can't ask for money? If, if I have that idea about, okay, I have the understanding of what do I feel about money, then what do I do next? You know, it, to go back to the beginning, right? When you're thinking about, just take it from how you feel initially, right? You're thinking about, I wanna do this business, I wanna launch this, I have a vision, I have an idea. And you think about how do I get someone to give me money? If it makes you want to throw up, I need you to stop and think why. If it makes you feel angry, like I can't believe I have to just ask these people for money when they have all this money and they should just give it to me. Why does it make you feel angry? If it makes you feel like forget it, it's not worth it, or it's probably not a good idea anyway, why does it make you feel insecure? So even just recognizing how it makes you feel and thinking about asking people to invest in something that you obviously really believe in and you obviously believe is a good idea or you wouldn't be spending all your time and energy doing it. Why does giving that opportunity to other people make you feel any amount of unhappy, wonderful mm -hmm. thing? right? So if you can find what the root is and you can unpack it and you can figure out how to work around it or how to get over it. But if you just keep hoping it will go away, it won't because it's, it's somehow packed in you. And in the same way that trauma is packed in us, your feelings about things are there. So you have to, you have to figure out how to deal with them so that then when you get in front of the right investor, it can be a clean slate of, listen, I do this incredible, amazing thing, or I'm trying to, to launch this company that is going to do X, Y, and Z, and this is why it matters. Um, any chance you want to hear more about it? Because that's it, right? It isn't, mm -hmm. I've just met you, I'm going to ask you for money. It's, there's this great need in the world, and this is how I'm going to meet the need or fix it or change it. Do you want to learn more? And that's, that's the ask. It isn't money. It's do they want to learn more? And then that conversation will take you to the money. Is there a difference between asking for money as a nonprofit or as a profitable business? I don't really think so. You know, I think the only difference between nonprofits and for-profits is that they have a tax code, right? It, you, you do, you do one thing you, you know, for a company, right? You, produce a product and you sell it and you make, um, you know, you increase revenue and you take that money and a bunch of it you take for profits and some of it you put back in the business. For a nonprofit, you have a product like it's education or it's healthcare or it's criminal justice reform and you provide that service to people, but philanthropy pays for that service. So the people that accept it, it isn't transactional in that way, but any extra philanthropy that's over at the end of the year doesn't go into anyone's pocket. It just goes right back into the program. So when you're raising money, you're still raising money to meet a need and to meet a solution that you've created. And you're just inspiring people to do it on behalf of somebody instead of for themselves. Um, but the same premises to sales go into nonprofit fundraising. How can we break that almost preconception of sales being not a great thing because a lot of us may think, oh, I'll call calls or I have to send this email. And that's, it comes back to the point that you were saying, makes us feel not the best feeling in the world, but perhaps sales is just being a world with a, con a word with a connotation that it's not very positive, but how can we break that in our brains? I don't know. You know, I don't know where that comes from. It's, you know, I, I'm sure it goes back to some you know, people selling potions out of the back of a wagon, you know, some, some crazy thing like that. But um, we all are consumers, right? 
everybody is a consumer. We consume information, we consume things, particularly this year, as far as I can tell, we consume many things. Um, we consume solutions for problems. You know, if, if we're for philanthropists, I'm not in the business of doing the thing that you do, but I believe it should happen. And I know it should happen. And I know that at least in the U S our government isn't going to give, isn't going to support it all the way. And I believe foster children need support, right? So I'm going to give money to this organization to make that happen. People who do sales, people who fundraise, I think raising money is the greatest thing on the planet. Like I really do. I think it is so much fun. I think the, the fact that I get to provide people who have resources to do really crazy things, right? I get to give them all of these options for ways to make the world better. Mm -hmm. And I can say to them, you want to do something important with your wealth. You want to do something that matters. I really believe that everybody wants to be great, right? I, I believe everybody wants to be somebody that helps other people and is kind and, and thinks of others and tries to make a difference and does what they can in the world. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to be an activist or everybody has to be a social innovator or a change agent. But for some people, what they can do is they can provide resources to help fund those people. And I never feel like I'm tricking anyone. I never feel like you know, I've had donors where they were interested in something and I was like, I don't actually think it's a match for you. Let me help you find the right match. Or I don't think this project is what you've been talking about. I know it sounds like that, but when I dig in a little, it's not the right thing for you. You know, part of that, the integrity of that and how you get over feeling about it is how you approach it. If all you want to do is make money, then it will, it will feel yucky to you if all you do is feel like you're hustling people and you're moving them for a gift as fast as possible. Um, that probably won't feel good after a while. I mean, it will probably feel really good. You have <laughs> great things for a little while, but I think long term, it won't feed your soul in the way that, that you probably want. And I think if you're doing something great and you have something that you actually think will help people or will improve people's lives, it should feel like a treat to get to share it with other people. You say to us that change requires resources. And today's theme obviously is how to get those resources and support for our businesses. Do resources come in hand in hand with support? Can they be separated? Or what comes first? Oh, good question. Um, I mean, it's very individualized, right? There are, <laughs> I mean, a lot of times when people want to give you support, it's because they don't want to give you money. Um, <laughs> and when they give you money, it's because they don't have time to give you support. So, um, you know, I always err on the side of, I would rather take your resources and money and decide how to get the support I need rather than have a funder or a donor say, we'll give you this gift, but you have to make these changes. I never like, at least for nonprofits, and I think this is probably true for people, you know, running companies as well. I never liked, I, I don't like the idea of changing the way you do your work to make it fit the money. Hmm. I think it's a dangerous model to keep tweaking, to get more money. I think you want your model and you want what you do to be able to stand on its own. And if somebody doesn't want to fund what you have, I don't think you should constantly be changing what you have because you do that enough times and you end up with something that looks nothing like what you intended. Um, and then you have people that fund you having outsized power for something that they don't actually totally understand. Hmm. Turns almost like someone else's dream or someone else's project, if that happens. And with that, you say, obviously, in your tech talk that we should have connections and relationships that are relational, not transactional. And for our audience, we want to know what's that fine line when it comes to having that relationship with our potential investors? Shall we be friends with them or shall we think about the whole thing? in a different light, a new concept on, on that type of relationship that we build with them. 
I think, you know, when I talk about being relational, not transactional, it's, it's more about you don't show up and say, this is what I'm doing. I want this money. There's, there's a courting process, right? There's who are you? What do you care about? Like, first, let me tell you about what we do here, right? You know, we exist because there is this need. We address this need. We're better than anybody else at it in the way that we do it. Um, you know, that's one part of the conversation. But the other part is really, why did you take this meeting with me to begin with? What was it about the proposal? What was it about the email? I know that, you know, you know, so and so and they asked you to take the meeting, you know, when when they explained what we do, what was what was interesting about that? And building a relationship with someone about do you fund a lot of things like this? You know, is this sort of a priority for you? Is what we do something that, that you've been interested in for a long time? So that you can think about who is this person and what do they care about? Why are they philanthropic at all? Or why are they investor at all? Why are they, why do they believe in impact investing? Why, how, why do they believe in social innovation? Why do they believe in any of these things? So you don't go into a meeting just launching in to 10 minutes about your business plan um, and at the end of it, they're like, okay, why don't you just leave that stuff with me? And you walk out and you think, I don't know how it went. <laughs> and of course you don't know how it went because you talked the whole time. And you also don't know how it went because you didn't ask them, what do you think? Is this aligned with what you care about? You know, what is it about what I've shared that is maybe most interesting to you? Or um, would you want to learn more about that's relational. That's trying to build a relationship with someone and talk to them. Um, if you go in and you drop the, you know, your business plan and then you head out the door, um, that's not relational. That felt very transactional to them. It felt like you showed up, you asked for it and you popped on out. So now being friends with donors, um, I certainly have a ton of donors that I consider friends. Um, but there's a difference between having a mutual respect and being friends and going out and partying with people every night. Mm -hmm. Like those are really different things. I think, you know, when I was younger, I probably thought that, um, you know, it was very normal to go out with donors a lot because a lot of the young fundraisers I knew that was something that they did all the time. Um, but when I, you know, once you get older, you're like, that's actually not how any of this business gets done. And the people that have time to go out with you every night are not the people that are going to give you money. <laughs> so, you know, I think you were also maybe out with the wrong donors. Um, but I think it is important to be able to feel like you know them and they know you. And it's important to be able to say to people too, I always say to my donors, like out of the gate when I'm sharing things with them, Listen, if this is not for you, just tell me, you know, I, you're not going to hurt my feelings. My job is to share with you all the ways we can partner and all the different ways that we can do this work. Um, if none of these are the right match for you, then they're not the right match. And if some of them are really not for you, tell me, I never want to hear about events again. Hmm. I have no interest in tech stuff. I don't want to do anything like they'll tell you, but you have to give them permission People are so polite, um, which is really funny because lots of times they're not, but they don't want to hurt your feelings in what I consider to be a totally okay thing to decide. It's your money. If it's not for you, you know, I once, I once left a message for a donor and I said, listen, like after like plain phone tag for months. I like laughed on his, because I had met him before, but then he was just dodging my phone calls. And I finally said, listen, I'm literally paid to call you to see if you are interested in doing these things. If you don't want to do any of them, please just email me or call me and tell me I don't ever want to go to events because I promise you, I will stop calling you. And I, and I like left my number and he called back and I picked up and he was laughing. He goes, I hate events. And I was like, great. I will never ask you about events again. Is it okay if I reach out around year end, you know, for your gift? And he was like, absolutely. I was like, great. And he was like, why didn't I call you earlier? I was yeah. like, I don't know. I don't. But, you know, I think 
friendships come from mutual, like real friendships for mutual respect and common ground. So build a relationship and a friendship will come from that. Don't think the friendship is going to get you to money. Okay. That's very clear. Yeah. And, and there must be tiers of friendships, as you say, some you want to go party with and some you just have to accept that is about the respect. You need mm -hmm. to sound and look natural when you're asking for money or asking for anything. And you need to, you're saying that we need to show that we care and that we understand what the others care about. Yeah. How do you do it in a sense that it doesn't look very produced? Like I only research you in Google and I'm just like regurgitating everything that I know about you. So it, it sounds more natural. So I do a ton of research. Don't ever go into a meeting without doing a ton of research about people. Um, I do a ton of research so that I understand what they care about and what they don't. So I can eliminate parts of my pitch that I know won't land with them, or I won't go down a rabbit hole around climate change if I know that's not their thing, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I do research so that I understand as much as I can what else they fund in the space and what they fund outside of it, where their priorities are, what they care about. I also do research on their families so I know a little bit about them and I understand who they are. And then I go to the meeting like I've done no research. Okay. So I go to the meeting and I just talk to them like I would anybody else. Because it is very creepy if I say, thank you so much for having me. You know, I saw that you graduated from Harvard and you know, you know, it's that you wouldn't do that with regular people. I consider the research as a way as like a service to them to be able to get us places faster without them feeling like they have to tell me their life story and without them feeling like I'm grilling them. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can instead lead the witness a little bit in the conversation and say, you know, as we talk about things, you know, you know, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? I also share a lot about myself in donor meetings. Like I say, I'm, I'm from Eastern Oregon. And I say, I went to school in California. And I say those things because people love to make connections. Right. And so they'll say, Oh, I had a, you know, I went out to Oregon once it was so beautiful in Portland. And I say, it is so beautiful in Portland. That is not where I am from. And, um, you know, or they say, I had a friend who went to school in Northern California too. Did you go to the same school? And all of these things, those connections help you build that relationship. And it's fun to talk about it. But if there are things that I really want to get to, if I have seen that they fund a lot of things like what I do, I will like, it's a very natural, easy question to say, do you fund, you know, do you fund other things in this space? Which if I know the answer, then they, they get to tell me and I don't tell them. Um, but it takes a little more work. Okay. Oh, that also connects to this, this next point I want, I want to talk about. As entrepreneurs, we always have that little hamster in our brain, right? We want to do everything. We want to show everybody what we do, all the services that I have, all the things that I can do for you. It's a little bit complex to tone down that energy and <laughs> perhaps drive that we have when, it, when we go to meetings. And we once heard from another of our speakers before she works, collaborates with big, big brands like Fendi. And she was saying, don't go to the meeting telling them that you know best and then you can do it better than what they want to do. Yeah. And you also say that in your TED talk, you need to listen. How do we find a balance between that hamster always wanting to run and the fact that we need to take a pause and perhaps listen more and don't think that our services or what or our ideas are the only ones. You know, I think when you're talking to prospective funders, I think, you know, my rule of thumb is generally to mirror whoever I'm meeting with. So if their energy is really brusque and really harsh and really quick and really, what do you want from me? Then, you know, I had a donor once that I walked in his office and he said, Kara, what the F do you want? And I said, I want you to double your gift. And he goes, great, fine. He goes, are we good here? And I go, sure. And I walked out and I got in the hallway and my heart was beating so fast, right? Because I was like, what just happened? But, you know, I walked, he was like, I have four minutes. What do you want? And I was like, okay, I want you to double your gift. That's, you know, that's the answer. And he was like, done. Are we good? Goodbye. 
Um, and that isn't normally how I would do a donor meeting, right? So, and then you have other people that really want to talk and they want to talk about why they're philanthropic or what they care about or how they grew up and how they think about this stuff. And they don't want you to ask for a gift for four or five meetings. Um, and so you have to really, if you're serious about getting people to invest in you, you have to figure out where they are and meet them there. And you have to be able to tone yourself down to mirror their energy because my natural energy will freak out like 80% of the general population. And I, you know, I, I, I can't even drink coffee. So I think, you know, I will walk in a room and I can assess pretty quickly where we're at and then you meet them where they're at. And that doesn't mean that you have to be a phony. It just means there's no reason to blow the roof off the place. Like it's okay to like get there and be a little bit slower. And, you know, I also think your energy and enthusiasm, you can talk eloquently about what you're doing without coming off like a rah-rah girl too. Mm. So um, a lot of it is practicing your pitch and who you are with people and being able to shape shift. Using a lot of tactical empathy, as you're saying yeah. with the, that mirroring and also being more open that we have to change our frequency from time to time. Mm -hmm. But then that could also hit our hearts very deeply when we get rejection. So how can we deal with rejection, which happens a lot when you're an entrepreneur and I'm sure also a fundraiser, and also, how can we follow up with those that already have reject us and we perhaps want to build another relationship or, or offer them different ideas? And you're saying we have to get rid of our baggage, but also perhaps ask this very powerful question that you say, would you consider? <laughs> I love would you consider. You know, I talk about this in my TED Talk, but would you consider is... Well, it does a couple of things, right? So the first thing it does is it's a much easier way to ask somebody for something with would you consider? Um, it's much easier than will you give me? Um, mm -hmm. So would you consider gives you a very, a much more natural ask because I think that's the scariest part for people when they're asking for money is how do you actually say the words, will you give me $10,000? <laughs> like that's not something we're used to saying, right? So you stumble over it, which makes it sound like you don't have confidence in the ask. So saying, you know, would you consider investing $10,000? And then you wait. And if they say, oh, that's, that's not what I was thinking, or that's not what I want to do that, you know, or that's a lot more than we were thinking. Um, you say, well, what would you consider? So it gives you a second ask, which is really handy. Um, because it also requires them to explain where they're at as opposed to, you know, we're not in position to do that right now, which is, you know, which kind of puts an end to the conversation. Yeah. Now, you know, with regards to your feelings around rejection, again, it's reframing, right? And it's saying, you know, this is not about me. It's an opportunity and it's either the right opportunity for them or it's not. And if it's not, it's not, it will be the right opportunity for someone. I just have to keep doing the work. And the other thing is if there are different levels of rejection, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, I won't take the meeting with you. That's you're dead in the water. But if someone will meet with you and they will keep meeting with you, you know, you see that with foundations and institutional funders a lot, and a lot oftentimes corporate partners, they want to understand what's going on. And there's lots of layers to get to a gift for them. So maybe they'll meet with you for three or four years in a row, and they still don't fund you. But if they're still meeting with you, they're trying to get you to a place where they feel confident about funding you. They're asking you all these questions to try to build you up. They're asking you for more information. They're asking you for more data points because they want to fund you. You're just not there yet. So you have to be able to say to yourself, they're still willing to talk about it. They're still willing to look at the prospectus. They're still willing to look at the new deck. They're still in it. They're not dead. It's when they say, we will never fund you or you know what you're not a match we're not even going to meet with you or we're not looking at it or we're not taking it that's when it's that's when it's truly rejection but a lot of times i think people get a we're not interested right now and they go okay instead of 
you know what, how do you feel if I, you know, can I check back in in six months? Are there things that we could do or think about before we come back? You know, yeah. or, you know, what is, what feedback do you have? If we're not a match for you, could you give me a really honest feedback about both how we presented our work and, and the product? And people are actually, if you ask them, pretty good about giving it to you, and that will help you cut down on your rejections. Do you have a lot of experience with getting that feedback? Do you feel that people are really, really open? Or there's more of them that they really don't want to give you that feedback? You know, it really depends on the human, just like with people in your life, right? There are some people that will give you an honest answer, and there are other people that will never give you an honest answer if it might put them in a weird situation. Um, you know, a lot of it goes with the relationship building and how you ask. So if somebody says, listen, we're not going to go forward with the investment and you say, why, you know, tell us what happened. That's a different thing. Or, you know, do you mind giving us feedback? That might get you something. But if you say, you know, I really appreciate it and I appreciate the time. Um, and I'd love to ask you like, could you provide like one or two points of feedback for us? And I think showing vulnerability is really helpful. I think saying, you know, we're just starting this. We've never done a big raise like this. We've never raised money or I just launching and I'm just starting this company. And, you know, you're one of the first meetings we've had, or, you know, you were a really big meeting for us. And, and I don't know if we blew it or not. I would love to hear, you know, did you feel like, you understood what we were talking about. Did you feel like we showed the ROI of our work? Like lead them a little bit to give them answers. But I think people respond to, we're trying to be better at this. Could you just give us something? Um, and I, I think people want to be helpful, but you have to make it easy for them so that they don't feel like a jerk in doing it. <laughs> to get more support and for our businesses, you were mentioning just now, we have to take it not personally. Oh, as an entrepreneur, I guess that's very, very hard because it all started with something that we believe in so passionately. Yeah. Can you give us any tips to surpass that personal level and feelings that we get in order to think, okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about my work. I have been building whatever service or, or product, but still I cannot take it to heart. Yeah. I mean, listen, I talk a big game. I feel everything. I feel everything. I have got a list of petty grievances. I've got a list of anyone that ever rejected me. Don't like it's practice, right? It's practice. And it's having a small collection of people that know you and respect you and love you. And that you can call when that happens and say this happened that will continue to build you back up. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also when you have bad meetings, which you will have bad meetings. I mean, I have some of the craziest meetings you can ever imagine with people. I had one person, I went into a donor meeting with he and another colleague, and he just covered my face up the whole time and talked to the other person. Like, I have no idea why. He, for 40 minutes, he kept his arm up with my face covered. And I had to be like, this is totally normal. Um, you know, I, I've had... On the whole, I would say 98, 99% of the meetings I've had with donors have been amazing. And a handful of maybe 20 meetings that were not great, but I had another colleague or someone I worked with to call to be like, this meeting went off the rails and I don't totally know what happened. Um, that can be like, yeah, sometimes it happens like that. Or sometimes it's not great, or it sounds like that person was not nice, or who cares if they're not aligned, or we don't want their money. You know, you have to build yourself a network of people that help you keep your chin up. Because when you're trying to build something, it's just rejection on top of big mountains to climb, on top of distraction, on top of all of these things. And you need people that are able to be like, just keep going, just keep going. You need your cheerleaders. And that's why a community like this one, Female Entrepreneurs yes. Worldwide, is just so great to have that access to support. What are the projects that you have been working on? I know you have very interesting and exciting projects. Oh, I do. I do. I, um, you know, my firm is a small firm, um, but small but mighty. 
Um, but we get to work on a lot of really great projects and the women that I have that work with me, my colleagues, every year we sit down and we talk about, you know, on top of kind of our regular clients, we talk about what work is important to us right now. So, you know, what, what clients we're working with. So, you know, we mainly do work in New York city, um, as a team. So we work a lot with places like the children's aid society and good shepherd services that serve you know, ballpark between 30 and 50,000 children and families in New York City. We also work right now, we work with the Legal Aid Society and we work with Osborne Association, which is criminal justice reform. Um, we, and we are staffed on a, on a sort of a massive project helping build the Obama Presidential Center, which is a $1.6 billion project to build the center in Chicago, which will be a hub for leadership development of leaders all around the world to go there. So basically, if you want to be a force for good in the world, you'll go to the Obama Presidential Center to learn how to do it, um, which is really fun. And it takes me to Chicago and DC, which are two great cities. Um, and I like to... I like to travel as a mom. I like a night in a hotel. Um, <laughs> and we do a lot of teeth, you know, we do a lot of teaching and learning. We're launching a webinar series. And um, the big thing is we only work, and this is a good thing for entrepreneurs to remember. We only work with clients that are doing work that we're passionate about. And we only work with clients that are doing work um, in a way that we can get behind. I will never sell something that I don't believe in. And we're very careful on making sure that, that the work that they do is effective and above board and impactful and, um, and led with some, not just the data, but also the heart. So I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, when you think about what you do, there will be lots of opportunity for you to launch something or get behind something that looks like it's gonna be successful. But if you don't buy into it and it isn't something you feel great about, it's really hard to love the work. Um, and I can't imagine ever wanting to get up every day and spend 10 hours every day doing something that I don't love and doesn't bring me joy. So um, that's a big part of how we approach what we do. And, and I think it's important for entrepreneurs because there's always a quick way to make something big, but you know, you have one life, you might as well really love how you spend your time. And I'm sure that's how also you get long lasting relationships that have supported you and given you resources the way that you need and you want. We know statistically that there's more male investors than female investors still in this day and age. What do you think we need to do in order to get more female to invest in different ideas and different pro uh, projects and also to close that gender gap in investment? Well, I mean, the biggest thing is we need to get more hands in, you know, more money into the hands of women, which means, you know, there's all sorts of systemic problems we need to talk about that, you know, women are underrepresented in most of the workforce and primarily in the areas where people make the greatest wealth, finance, private equity, hedge funds, um, global banking. Um, so I think, you know, as that continues to change and evolve over time, we will have more women that have control over more money. Um, I also think historically fundraisers and organizations um, and entrepreneurs historically ask women and people of color for less money than they do their male counterparts to have the same amount of wealth. So I think that's a bias that people that are raising money don't recognize they have. So you have two donors that have the exact same amount of money and they'll ask the woman for half the amount that they asked the man for. Um, or when there are meetings with investors that are men and women couples, they will only speak to the men. Mm -hmm. They won't include when they're speaking to men, they won't include, you know, do you and your partner do you and your spouse talk about this? Is it, are these investments things you make as a family? Are these things you talk about together? Do we want to include them in the conversation? Um, so on our side as fundraisers, we can continue to keep an eye on those things and push. And as, you know, as entrepreneurs looking to raise money, we can always be thinking about who are these people um, and, and are we treating them the same way we treat everybody else? Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we need to get, 
more women in positions of power, so they have control over these funds. Do we get less money too if we are asking for it as women? I don't think so. I think good fundraisers can figure out how to get the money. Um, okay. But, you know, I don't. I actually think, and this is just my own bias, I think there is, because the majority of wealth is head by, held by men, I think oftentimes women have an easier time threading the needle with men because mm -hmm. we are trained from such an early age to be accommodating, right? And to make it comfortable. Whereas I think if you have an alpha male that is used to running the room and being brusque like that, um, I think they have an easier time letting their guard down when they're not trying to be like the big man on campus in the meeting. Um, but that's my own, you know, I don't think that's every fundraiser's experience at all. Like, I think that's my experience. Mm -hmm. Um, but the bigger thing is the number one reason why people don't give is because they weren't asked directly. Like when you ask, they say, no one asked me, like, why didn't you increase your gift? You gave $10 million to this hospital, but you only give $1 million to us and you're on the board. Well, no one here ever asked me for $10 million. So, you know, I always say like the, my motto is don't ask, don't get. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I always say like, you have to ask people to consider doing more. No one is going to wake up one day and be like, you know what I should do? I should double my gift. Like, it just doesn't happen. So you have to be able to talk with them and move them and, and let them feel like, you know, that it's a decision that you're nurturing them through. Because at the end of the day, they have all the power. It's their money. We can't make them do anything. I'm not going to confuse someone or convince someone or sway someone. All I'm going to do is keep telling you why your gift can make this huge impact or why your investment can change the world. and and consider it. Think about it. We can help you do something extraordinary with your wealth. Um, but it's up to you if you want to do it or not. Um, and I think that takes a lot of pressure off the conversation. Yes, we are not trained to ask, unfortunately, but that's why we also have these platforms to learn how to ask for yeah. more. And what's the worst that could happen at the end of the day? They, they say, you, you already no. have the no. Yeah, it's a no. It was a no if you didn't ask. So you might as well just ask and see what happens. I mean, and I also think it's okay to say, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's good to couch things, right? To say, listen, I may be completely out of line on this, but, you know, would you consider investing blank? And, you know, is that the right number? Maybe that's not the right number. What do you think? You know, I think it's okay to let them know this is a conversation and I, you know, I want to talk through it together with what makes sense for you. Um, you know, it all goes back to like, fake it till you make it, right? Just be fearless in the process and know that like, it might not work out, but that's okay. That it's so true. We need to be bold and unapologetic. And with that note about asking, I want to open the floor and let our audience talk to you, Kara. And I always, I always, when she's in the crowd, I always ask the first question to be from her side because she always has very insightful questions to Rachel. Hello from Canada. Any questions you want to ask to Kara? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, what do you find or how do you find the most effective way to build and maintain relationships with those investors, especially now during COVID, everything's so virtual. So how do you kind of build that um, empathy in the room, in a virtual room like Zoom? It's such a good question, Rachel. Um, you know, I, I'm a feeler, right? So, you know, you talk about the empathy virtual, that's, it's a really hard thing for people that like are used to being able to feel energy and shift to energy and, and, you know, a virtual world. Now I will say on Zoom, you also have an up close audience to people's faces and how they respond in a way that you don't have in person. So in person, you can feel their energy and you're watching them, but on a Zoom call, you're actually really watching them respond in real time. And that can help lead your, your conversation a little bit better so that you can be more intuitive by, based on their body language and their facial expressions you can see differently. Um, but I think everyone has gotten kind of good at it in the last year. You know, I would say, 
last spring and the summer, the meetings were really kind of wonky with donors. They were hard, like no one knew how to do it. Now everyone's guard is so down. You have donors that are like in a tank top talking to you in their garage. <laughs> You know, you're like, I've never not seen you in a suit and you're clearly are working in the boxes in your garage. Um, and it's made people, I think, be a little more open and to be able to be like, as their child runs through the room or it's loud or it's not, it's added a humanness to the conversations, which I actually think has, has been good. Um, but I think you have to say, listen, this is really hard. And the other thing is, this was a really hard year for people, for everybody. Um, and that also has brought a lot more honest conversations with people too, about how are you doing? How's your family? You know, and have you guys been healthy and how are things? And, you know, do you have kids in school? And people have been sharing more about their personal life, um, which I also think have helped to build relationships, you know, that you would never have had that before. You wouldn't have known that stuff. If someone didn't want to share that, you wouldn't have known it. But anybody who is trapped at home with children that aren't in school is dying to tell you about it, as it turns out. So I think, you know, you have to use the tools you have at your disposal. And right now in a virtual world, it's really watching how we are with each other. It's trying to make the connections around the shared experience the whole world is in right now. Um, and then keep maintaining your, this is why I'm here today. Like, I want to share this with you. I want to get your feedback. I want to see if this might be something you're interested in. So you always lay the agenda out for them so that they also don't think the whole call is like this weird conversation at the end. They're like, I don't even really know what she wanted from me. Um, so I think it's important to lay that out because it will put the donor or the investor at ease to know what's coming. So they don't feel the whole time that out of nowhere, you're going to be like, will you give me $50,000? So, you know, I think, I think those things are, are some of the tricks and some of the tools that I use. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's super helpful. And I totally agree with you. I mean, the beauty of being on Zoom with people, as you're right, they get their kids walking behind the camera or their dog or their cat. So it starts up a conversation that's so authentic about um, their life. And it's not just some sort of research you found online about their family. You get to see it live action, which is super awesome. Yeah, it's nice. It's a little bit of yeah. it's fun. It's different. I, I mean, I will be so happy to be back in person with people, but it, it wasn't the disaster I thought it could have been this year. So, um, you know, that's, that's a good sign. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Rachel. And I want to know, and this is a very personal question, Shall we run around and try to get to every single event possible and pitch here, pitch there as someone asking for money as an entrepreneur, but also as an investor? We have all these events that started with live events that you have the investors walking around the floor and trying to check out the new ideas and all the startups trying to catch the investors. And now because it's online, we are there's an event every single day of the week, I guess every single hour because we are open to the world. Mm -hmm. How can we narrow that down? I think you have, un, you, know, you have limited hours in the day, right? So I think doing your homework on who are the top 30 prospects for you. Like who are the top 30 people you really want to spend time with and you really want to get in front of and you really want to talk to, you know, going to events and meeting people and, and sharing your work and hoping that it works out and that they take the meeting later is one approach, right? But you can decide who the 30 best investors or the 30 best donors are, and you can sit down with each one of them and map them. Who do you know in your life? Follow the threads. Who are the, who's the decision maker there? Who's the person you need to get in front of? Where did they go to school? Where do their kids go to school? What neighborhood do they live in? Where do they work? What are their hobbies? What do they do? Who in your life? And you pull the thread for each one until you can find one person for each one of those prospects that can make an introduction for you. If it's me trying to raise money, I map it, you know, I will hit those events and I'll do that. If you don't get the hits you need from it, 
then I would be like, who's my wish list? And I'm going to start working on them one at a time until I can figure out how to get in front of them because it's the high, it's a higher ROI because you don't need to get in front of 30. You need to get in front of three of them. Mm. Um, and you could go to 15, 20 events and not get meetings from any of them because they came away with 4,200 business cards and somebody's going to research those before they decide who to talk to. And what you need, right, is 30 minutes with the right person. So figure out how to get in front of the right person. A lot of backstage work. Yeah. Yeah. Research, research, research. I love that. I would want to ask you if there's no any other questions on the floor. I can see, Rachel, any other questions. We also have uh, Lee Wai and Julie Chan. They are connected here with us. Obviously, please ask a question if you wish. But while we wait, what, are, what would be your number one advice if you were to leave us with something here that we want to remember about you? What would that be? I, I hope that if, if doing this work and getting investors and making it happen and raising money, if you don't take joy from it, find a different job. If you don't take joy from doing it, it's not the right one for you. Hmm. And that doesn't mean you can't add value. It doesn't mean you can't start at a startup. It doesn't mean you can't work in an amazing place. It doesn't mean all the things that you want to happen from this. But if you don't enjoy the chase of making it happen, why were you doing it? You know, so I think really asking yourself, what is it I want to do and what is it I want to accomplish? Are there other ways to get there? You know, for my own career, I thought I would be in a different part of the business. And I followed this thing that I had was having fun doing and I was good at, and it created a whole career for me that I didn't even know was an option because I was willing to pivot. Um, and I was willing to try something new and I was willing to be like, I mean, when I went into fundraising for nonprofits, I took a massive pay cut. It took me like seven years to get back to what I was making before that. Um, and I never regretted that because I was so much happier than what I was doing before I went into nonprofit work. So um, I think really check yourself on why am I here? What am I doing? Um, and is this where I want to be? because you can change the world lots of ways, but there, it should bring you joy. Can we delegate as a founder or a business owner when we know that we are in the stage that we have to ask for money or funding, but perhaps it doesn't bring us joy, as you are saying, can we delegate it? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, usually you want your CEO to be your, your head fundraiser. Lots of CEOs and executive directors are very bad at it. So they have great chief development officers or business development people or ad heads of advancement or heads of, of fundraising, all of these things. They have somebody very skilled at it that does a lot of the back office work, that, gets, that does the first meeting with donors, that gets them excited, that tells them all about it. And then they bring the CEO in when it's time to really talk about the work in a passionate way. So if you can find a great partner to do that with you, that can do the logistics and can move the donor and have the conversations and get them ready, that knows how to use an inspirational, transformational, bold leader that doesn't want to ask for money, you can tag team that. There's no reason why you can't because it is, they are going to fund because the CEO gives them confidence that this is a good investment, but they don't have to be the person that asks for money. And if they want to be the person that asks for money, then you hire somebody like me or, you know, somebody in the business to coach you and teach you how to do it. Yeah. Um, I work with, right now I work with five different CEOs um, just around how you ask for money. Um, it's not a natural skill. It, it's not a natural skill. You have to be taught how to do it or you're naturally good at it. And most people have to be taught how to do it. So. Um, if you recognize that that's a weakness and you want to learn how to do it, just get a coach. Have somebody walk you through and practice and do fake donor meetings with you and make you run through it and ask all the questions. Um, and you'll get, you don't have to do it forever. You'll do six months of coaching and you'll be ready to go forever. But, um, 
don't think just because you're the boss, you should know how to do this. It's actually, as it turns out, a real job fundraising. So it's like a whole profession um, and it has best practices and, and getting a little help is, is a good idea probably for everybody. Yeah, I'm sure you're also very busy. Connect, develop yourself, don't be afraid. As you were saying, know, know your background, know your weaknesses and also know your strengths. But most importantly, know what makes you feel and what gets you passionate about what you're doing. This is all the things that I get from our conversation. If there is no other questions, Nia, please let us know. I'm very, very glad to have had you here, Kara. Thank you very much for your time. At these very early hours in the morning <laughs> there in New York, Rachel is saying clap, clap, clap. And hopefully we can see you soon again in our platform, online events or face to face. But remember, if you want to connect with Kara or get more resources, support and uh, connections and network, please contact our team and hashtag ask few anything. You can go to the website, our IG or any other social media platforms where you can connect with us. Thank you again. My name is Jamilet. Thank you, Cara Logan Berlin and Nia.